Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am uh, Ihsan Gennun, International Relations Specialist at the OCP Policy Center, a think tank here in Morocco and also one of the partners of the World Policy Conference. I'm very delighted to have on stage Mr. Tatsu, who will be reporting on the workshop on energy, as well as Mr. Jean-Claude Trichet, who will be reporting the workshop on economy and finance. I will be doing the reporting of the Africa workshop myself. So I'm very delighted to give you the floor, Mr. Tatsu. Would you like to start? Uh, Merci bien. Bonjour. Uh, I'm very happy to talk about uh, energy and climate change. It's a long story, already talked 100 times, but we need 100 times more to talk. I'm very fortunate to say we have a wonderful debate engaging panelist audience on imminent challenges like uh, very hot issue like US China trade tensions or Iranian sanction or short term and long term agenda on energy security and sustainability above all our fight against climate change let me summarize wonderful debate into just eight points number 1 recognition of big picture, where we are sitting, how things may evolve. Point number one, United States is turning into undisputed leader of oil and natural gas. They are champion of fossil world, fossil fuel world. On the contrary, China is switching to green. They became champion of renewable energy development. Three, solar PV is on track to be the cheapest source of new electricity. Absolutely, some are less than 3% per kilowatt-hour in the many places. Number four, electrification. This is already a very key word today. Electrification will be accelerated in various fronts. Air conditioning, mobility, and digitalization. This is a big point, number one. Number two, about US-China trade tension. We approached from various perspectives, and the conclusion was tension between two countries will not have big impact on energy trade. Because US gas and oil has many outlets, not to say over Europe or Asia Pacific, and China is a small area for import. And China has many places to import oil and natural gas. Russia, Middle East, Asia countries, and even domestic energy sources. Number three, China is greening very fast its energy system. And that will be actuated. But it is not just because of government policy. Because of huge market, the size matters, and many players actively competing with each other. Entrepreneurs or big companies, national companies as well. For example, clean tech companies in China was roughly about 2,700, 2,005. It grew up to well over 50,000 in 2015 and already continued to grow. And China is in the process of launching the world's largest carbon market. Actually, my, my friend is designing this very carefully, and that will be most effective and the largest. Again, the size matters. Number three, over 50% of newly registered EVs in 2017 are all in China. Again, size matters and policy and entrepreneurship matters in greening. Point number four, very topic issue. We discussed one belt, one road here, and there is an energy dimension on that issue. But the story is quite interesting. 130 new coal-fired power plant is in the process of building under Chinese leadership along belt and road region. 130 new coal-fired power plants. And just looking back short history, from year 2000 to 2016, 
well over 240 coal-fired power plants has been built under the Chinese leadership, finance, and technology, again, in the region. So ironically, China is greening at home and blacking abroad. Number five, impact of Iranian sanction. This is a really hot issue, and we had uh, someone from Aramco, we have someone from Total, and good exchange. The conclusion was that even though the US pressure could be very tight, China may have a way to uh, you know, set aside all these sanctions and can import directly from China by quoting in Liminbi, not dollars. But in the worst case scenario, if Middle Eastern tension may go up and geopolitics may override rationale over everyone, there could be a risk of missile attacks against state of Hormuz, which could increase skyrocket oil prices again. Nightmare could happen because 20% or more of oil is traded through that Hormuz straight and roughly 38% of LNG should have again come from that outlet. Number five, number six, uh, op there is a uh, op optimistic view on transport electric sectors because of uh, increased deployment of investment and technology into number one, battery to be mounted on sea car, and mass production is making every cost lower, and plus favorable policy environment. However, and there's a big fire, but someone intervened. Look, there are so many IEC internal combustion engine cars are deployed, far bigger than the EV, and once they are deployed on the road, they'll stay alive at least seven, eight, nine years in some European countries over 15 years. So it's very difficult to replace all these. So I proposed why not convert used cars into a vehicle. Cost is much cheaper. And if you recall wonderful experience of uh, wedding of Henry, King Prince Henry, he drove Blue Jaguar out of the Windsor Castle. It was converted electric vehicle. Why don't take the example from this and then compete, uh, complement these uh, new EVs and converted EVs. Number seven, nuclear. Nuclear is an issue we have to tackle with talk about climate change energy. But conclusion was nuclear could be the most costly sources for electricity if it is newly built nuclear power plants because of intensified security safety requirements after Fukushima. Only way out would be generation four, that is small and medium uh, uh, scale uh, nuclear power plants. But still, SML is not easy to build. Last point, technology. We always dream about technology. Today, there are many technologies we haven't dreamt of 10 years ago. 20 years ago. So why not new technology surprise us in coming 10 to 20 years and make revolution after revolution? But for that purpose, we recognize two important things. The death, valley of death for technology. First valley is technical valley to develop into really usable technology. Number two, the financial valley of death. Even though there is a demo plant if no one invests for commercialization, it won't be there. So why not overcome all this? But uh, bottom line is it is a matter of mindset for people because climate change is my mind. So if men don't think that way, women don't think that way, it won't be solved. So last conclusion is now we, and we have plenty of agenda to discuss Next year, 
in this World Policy Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tatsu. So moving on to the uh, Africa workshop. So um, the Africa workshop uh, started by drawing up some of the main challenges that are at stake on the African continent. And we identified three of them. So on the one hand, there is obviously uh, providing more opportunities of employment to the growing, uh, uh, to the youngest population in Africa. Africa's population is getting younger and younger, and this is an issue that should be considered because otherwise it uh, comes with some consequences that I will come on uh, later on. Um, also, there is the issue of managing the economic sovereignty of the states, uh, and with this comes the need for a greater economic integration on the regional and the continental level. So, on the economic aspects, some of the main challenges that remain is that Africa uh, as a continent is still quite fragmented. And we can see that because most of the inter-African trade only represents a small share of the global trade at the world level. So African uh, states do not trade enough with each other. And this is because there are some barriers to that. And there are barriers that need to be lifted in order for the African countries to start uh, trading with each other. In addition to that, we also pointed out that most of the trade in, uh, in between the African states is, uh, is composed of manufacturing as well as agriculture. Whereas uh, on the outside of the continent, it is mainly uh, under the form of um, uh, industry, uh, industry and natural resources. So African countries need to bring their efforts together in order to increase the inter-African uh, trade. So obviously the solutions to that is greater integrations. But there are some um, hiccups that block this regional integrations. And uh, as uh, Prime Minister Zansu uh, has explained, the transaction costs for trade are still very high in Africa. They're still really high and they undermine the potential of Africans to trade between, between uh, each other. And they, they are the highest in the world and this is still a, a main challenge for them. There is uh, recently uh, the uh, African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement that was uh, brought up. It was praised as a great initiative to address in the issue of the, the need for greater integrations. However, there are some uh, technicalities that block this agreement from being properly implemented. And this was pointed out by Dr. Dadouj, who explained that there are three main challenges to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. First of all, there is the need for more inclusiveness of this agreement. Why? Because not all of the countries have signed. It's probably 45 or 46 countries who signed this agreement. Nigeria has not signed the agreement yet, which is one of the biggest economies on the continent. And although it's, it's said that it will implement it, it still has not done so. And, and Nigeria still has some complex political uh, economy, so we are waiting to see what will happen out of this. The second technicality of this agreement is that they need to explain better what they mean by liberalizing 90% of trade. Do they mean 90% of the volume of trade, which is fine, or do they need 90% of the tariff lines? In that case, it could be problematic, because countries can find ways to navigate around it and skip some of the terms of the agreement. And finally, uh, the, um, the other uh, issue of this uh, agreement is the rules of origins. The rules of origins, and we see that very often at the WTO, many FTAs are abused because people change the, uh, the origins of the products. And so 
The rules of origins really should be strictly regarded in order for the African Continental Free Trade Agreement not to be abused. So those are some of the, um, of the economic challenges that still exist on the continent. We also had the perspective of Europe uh, with the Minister Elisabeth Kigu, who explained to us where, you, where Europe stands in the middle of this. So she stressed the need for Europe to rethink partnerships together with Africa for a partnership that is more of a win-win uh, partnerships, that's more collaborative. And she also stressed the responsibility of the European continent to rethink its perception of the African continent. Europe has to counter the populist discourse because the populist discourse is gaining more importance with this, obviously, it will lead to Europe closing its borders to Africa. If Europe closes its borders to Africa, obviously, Africa will have to seek new partners. It will have to seek new partners for addressing its need for infrastructure development. And this is something that could be really problematic if the, the, the populist fear dominates on, on the European continent. So there was also, in the middle of this economy, partnerships, comes a very important point, which is the migration, the human mobility capital. And this has been addressed as well during the workshop, because with an increase in growth, the human uh, mobility will necessarily increase. People are seeking new opportunities abroad, and the continent should be ready to welcome those people who can contribute to the growth of their continent as well. And this was also brought up because we need to understand that migrants do not come without, um, the migrant should not be perceived as a threat, but rather as an opportunity to contribute to the growth of the uh, Europe can, European continent, but also to the African continent. And now, moving on to an example of how African countries can work together. And here I would like to bring up one uh, concrete example that was uh, explained to us by uh, Chairman and President Mustafa Tarab from the involvement of OCP Group in Africa. So OCP Group is involved with different African partners, with different African countries, and beyond just selling fertilizer, it actually works with the locals in order to adapt the products to meet the benefits and to meet the specificities of African soils. And this comes with some work that has been done on the field with many uh, fertili uh, fertility maps that were conducted in order to understand the specificities of every soil and to produce fertilizers that are adaptable to the, to the needs of those soils. And with this, they br brought up very innovative ways to collaborate with African countries. So uh, depending on the different natural resources that every country has, the, the Moroccan experience comes with phosphates and fertilizers, while the others come with other uh, components that are then uh, brought together uh, in order to present products that are adaptable. And so in this, it's a, a great example again, whereby the African countries can collaborate together to address the need for more fertilizers for the agriculture in order, instead of going abroad and seeking products from outside the, the continent. And finally, just to um, bring up another point on uh, the free trade agreement. Uh, Prime Minister Lionel Zansu also pointed out the, uh, the fact that in Benin, for example, 7.5% 7 of the GDP comes from taxes that are on exports. And this is huge, and this undermines the production and uh, undermines the, the local production and uh, is a barrier to uh, the production going outside of the country. So this is also something that maybe the continent has to address. And finally, uh, I would like to end up on a note uh, that was brought up by former Prime Minister Adi Mariam Dizalin from Ethiopia, 
who said that Africa is not a battleground for the other powers. Africa, we should stop with this dichotomy of Africa, Europe, or Africa, China, or Africa, United States. Africa is a growing power, is, has its place on the global scene and should be addressed as a partner like the others. It is not a field for battle for the foreign partners. Thank you very much. Mr. Trichet. So as far as uh, our uh, workshop was concerned, we uh, had uh, the benefit of having uh, speakers, I will mention them, and the main uh, approach that they had, Ida Kiao, on multidimensional vulnerabilities of the economic and financial system, a vision coming also from China. Jean-Claude Meyer, a vision coming from, from Europe on the risks of a new global financial crisis. Jeff Frieden on the political economy of global economic and financial issues the world over, in time of uh, populism in particular. Uh, Daniel Dan Dayanou on global economic and financial fragilities uh, in the emerging countries as well as in the, the global economy. As you see, a lot of concentration on risks and vulnerabilities, by the way. Uh, Motoshige Ito on the lessons of the Japanese crisis experience, which uh, came before the uh, big crisis of 2007-2008. Uh, and Bertrand Badré on the reset, the necessary reset of the financial sector to address particularly environmental issue. Uh, I would say that uh, as an introduction of our very, very uh, rich discussion, uh, we, uh, we are all incorporating the fact that we are living in a new uh, world of uh, strong criticism of old multilateralism, which uh, is coming, I would say, from everywhere, by the way, coming from the emerging world, criticizing the, uh, I would say, governance of the advanced economy and the fact that the G7 passed the baton to the G20 is, of course, a case in point. It comes out of the dramatic crisis which, uh, where, where the advanced economy proved to be very clumsy, obviously, because it, the epicenter of the crisis was in the advanced economy. It comes from the public opinion in the advanced economy themselves, uh, with a strong criticism of previous leadership, previous, uh, uh, I would say, uh, governments, and uh, the clumsiness of these governments uh, in, uh, in the crisis, or leading to the crisis, and I would say more generally, uh, it comes also from some executive branches, the US being a case in point, when, where the old multilateralism is also criticized by those who were absolutely key, of course, in running the old multilateralism. So it, it I would say, is making an environment which is uh, uh, very, very interesting in a way, but also very negative on global cooperation at this stage. Now, to uh, expose uh, what uh, we have discussed, I would concentrate first on the issue of uh, the risks and vulnerabilities of the uh, global economy and global finance first. Then I will concentrate a little bit on the political economy of uh, the uh, financial sector and uh, of the uh, appreciation of what should be done or not been done uh, at a global level, but particularly, of course, uh, uh, if I may, in, in, the, in Europe and in the United States of America, but true also in the emerging economy. And then I will mention a number of uh, points that we discussed are uh, clearly important and uh, we're coming out of the uh, discussion uh, itself. Um, but we are not uh, necessarily uh, directly linked to the two uh, previous uh, elements. So, on the appreciation on the risks and vulnerability, as I already said, there were clearly more interventions and more remarks, more questions on the vulnerabilities and on the risks than on the assets associated with the present situation. If I sum up a very rich discussion, I would say that uh, uh, maybe we could separate the implicit systemic uh, 
vulnerability that we are observing today in the system, in the global system, and the trigger for a possible explosion. So the trigger would not necessarily represent an explosion by themselves, but they could, you know, uh, uh, put uh, the explosive, if there is an explosive, in uh, bursting out and create a big crisis. The probability of uh, the future crisis being as demanding and as dramatic as the last uh, great crisis that we had to cope with was more or less implicitly very high in the minds of many uh, participants in this workshop, which uh, has to be mentioned as an element of, uh, of uh, I would say, full understanding of the risks that are at stake. Uh, if I concentrate a moment on the trigger very rapidly, I would say that you, you'd have a lot of mention of geopolitical risks, a lot of mentions on the fact that at a time we will probably have a big correction on stock markets uh, in many economies, but particularly perhaps in the US economy as a possible trigger for uh, major difficulties. Of course, the less accommodating monetary policy and the end of extraordinary unconventional measures in particular, which uh, is already uh, uh, implemented in the US and will be uh, in, the, uh, in Europe very soon, was also uh, one uh, possible trigger. And I could list a, a number of other, but I will uh, stop there. As regards the vulnerability of the system itself, I would say, first, the criticism of multilateralism in a global economy and a global finance system that are highly integrated and where contagion is uh, uh, extremely likely, like, as we observed in the last crisis, but will be even, in my opinion, uh, more uh, extraordinary uh, um, rapid in the possible new crisis. Uh, we have uh, the uh, over indebtedness of the global uh, economy and global finance, which has been underlined by many interventions. Uh, the proportion of debt outstanding public and private over the global GDP has augmented after the crisis as it did before the crisis, which is highly paradoxical because there was a consensus to recognize that. Uh, the level of leverage, the over-indebtedness of, the economy, uh, of the economies was uh, one of the main causes for the uh, big crisis we had to cope with. But again, leverage has continued to augment after the crisis. And uh, of course, the leverage uh, has augmented uh, less than before in the advanced economy and much more than before in the emerging economy. Uh, which has to be uh, underlined, but uh, which uh, is not particularly reassuring in a way because it has continued to augment, all taken into account, private and public debt in the advanced economy, namely putting themselves in a situation of vulnerability that is at least as vulnerable as uh, the day before the, the last crisis. And in the emerging world, the acceleration of leveraging has been, uh, financial leveraging has been very, very impressive. It's not absurd to consider that it had been multiplied by five if you compare what happened before the crisis and what happens after the crisis. Another element which uh, has to be mentioned as being part of the systemic vulnerability of the system is the fact that the advanced economy in particular, but it is true also for a number of uh, emerging economies, the ammunition to counter the next recession slack, uh, slack, uh, crisis uh, is uh, something uh, that uh, is deeply lacking. The uh, uh, fiscal ammunition are very, very meager in most economies, and the monetary policy ammunition are very, very meager, not to, uh, not to speak of zero level in uh, the uh, Japanese economy and the European economy, and are very meager in the US, 
which is in advance in the cycle, but in the US, some remark was made on the fact that it is necessary to have 5% decrease of interest rates to, to be significant in combating a recession, and it's very unlikely that the next recession will not uh, have to, the, the, the Fed will not have this ammunition when the next recession comes. So all taken into account, you see a, a number of observations that were all reinforcing the sentiment that uh, all leaders, all, uh, I would say, economies, uh, all uh, responsible uh, private and public uh, persons and individuals had to be very, very aware of the fact that uh, resilience in the next uh, possible crisis was absolutely fundamental because, again, the probability of new correction was quite high. On the positive element, which were also mentioned, I don't want to be entirely negative because I, it would not be fair, uh, I have to mention the fact that uh, uh, some remarks were made on the fact that imbalances, external imbalances in particular, had been reduced, uh, all taken into account since the crisis. The uh, current account of China is uh, less uh, important than was, it was before. Uh, in the US, we are living today with a minus 2.5% approximately of current account, which is not the the very, very uh, important uh, uh, level which were attained before the crisis. In Europe, it is plus 3.5%, which is probably too much, by the way, but does not signal a drama. So again, uh, th this is an element that we must have in mind. Uh, the prudentials have been improved. I think that nobody disputes that, even if there was a lot of screening of the prudentials, recognizing that uh, a lot of things had been done, particularly in the domain of the banks, but that a lot remained to be done in the domain of the non-banks, in the domain of uh, the pro-cyclical elements that are implicit in, uh, uh, for instance, uh, accounting rules uh, or uh, in uh, credit rating agencies uh, uh, posturing uh, or in many other elements that are uh, clearly uh, not reassuring or not fully reassuring as regards the present level of uh, prudentials and uh, not fully reassuring in case we have to cope with new drama. But again, I would not be fair if I would not mention the fact that uh, a lot of hard work has been done, obviously, since the crisis on the basis of a global consensus. So benefiting still from this idea that uh, we are in an integrated global economy and we have to address particularly global finance and uh, global financial potentials through this collegial global approach which has been <coughs> uh, signaled uh, by uh, the G20 uh, decisions, uh, successive decisions, and the G20 is still operating, still uh, giving his own stamp to a number of proposals which are coming from the Basel system of prudentials and from, uh, from uh, the, all the, I would say, committees that have been set up uh, and are uh, overseen by the G20 through the uh, Global uh, Financial Stability Board. Now, let me turn to political economy, if I still have time. I have time. Um, then I have to say that we had a, a lot of discussion, uh, introduction by uh, Jeff Frieden, as I said, and this idea that uh, we have to cope with a new phenomenon, which is linked to what I was saying, the criticism of globalization, the criticism of the old multilateralism, with resentment uh, particularly visible in the Eurozone in particular, again, adjustment against uh, um, bailing out the banks, <coughs> again, uh, transfer in general, uh, in many uh, public opinion, we, we have really an element of uh, strong criticism of what happened uh, during uh, the crisis. And uh, we see that uh, in all countries, practically, the remark was made that uh, in practically all countries, the previous uh, governments, uh, uh, that had responsibilities, whether they were on the left side of the, uh, of the political persuasion, on the right side of the political persuasion, were all more or less 
weakened in all countries, even in the countries that were uh, successes in terms of, uh, of economy and uh, in terms of uh, combating unemployment, uh, attaining full employment. So it's a, a phenomenon which is very impressive to the benefit from time to time of the extremist on the right side of the uh, political persuasion or on the left side of the political persuasion, or even the extraordinary case of uh, centrism uh, being the bene having the benefit of this rejection of previous, uh, uh, I would say, governmental uh, political parties, like in my own country. But all, all that to mention that we, we have a very, very strong problem which is emerging out of the, uh, of the public opinion, of the evolution of uh, political uh, persuasions, in, uh, certainly in Europe, but I would say in all advanced economies, not to mention uh, the UK with the Brexit and the United States of America where we see a lot of strong criticism, job losses being attributed to the mobility of capital, which is of course part of the uh, global economy as it has functioned until now. A very strong still criticism of bank bailouts, even if in my memory uh, we do not have at the level of significant institution losses made by the Treasury. Uh, on the contrary, it was also the case in Europe. In most cases in Europe, uh, profits were made by the governments out of their intervention on the financial markets. But nevertheless, in the, in the mind of the population, in the mind of our fellow citizens, these bank bailouts were very, very costly and uh, are still considered as extremely anormal as I said, including and perhaps even more in the United States of America. So uh, it is, of course, what I, all what I say is um, a recognition that the main political problem in the advanced economy, and perhaps if you look at Brazil and at other emerging economies, in all participants in the global economy, is that we, we have a wave of nationalism, protectionism, and in some respect, uh, fight against immigration, uh, which is uh, very, very important, perhaps the most important political problems for uh, leaders in all uh, societies and nations. Uh, it seems to me that it is just to say that we understood uh, in uh, the workshop that those complaints were fully understandable, that a, a lot of our fellow citizens were very much in danger, the, particularly the, the, the part of our uh, population that is less educated, less uh, able, I would say, to cope with the new challenges, uh, and is hurt by, not only, uh, as I already said, by uh, the competition which uh, had intensified all over the world, uh, the global economy, and uh, of course put, put uh, those fellow citizens in a difficult situation, but also science and technology that are galloping and are also new difficulty for, uh, for those of our fellow citizens, uh, the, I would say, education of which and the franchise of which is uh, weakened by uh, the digital revolution and by their enormous difficulty to catch up with the new uh, technologies. And of course, we, I could uh, elaborate on, on this. So as you see, we spend quite a, a lot of time on reflecting on this interaction between a, a, an obvious political problem and the global economy and global finance with, <coughs> with a sentiment that global finance was very much at stake uh, in all this, uh, this uh, new era and of course, uh, call for uh, appropriate responses. I already said that we, we had also a number of other views, dimension of this highly multidimensional discussion we had. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion on the Japanese experience and uh, not forgetting that Japan uh, had to cope with more or less the same kind of challenges as the other advanced economy, but a long time in advance, say more than approximately 10 years in advance. And it, it's a little bit sad to recognize that the other advanced economy at the time 
were thinking or, say, or, or saying very eloquently and publicly that the Japanese were extremely clumsy in dealing with their problem and that uh, uh, it was possible to solve those problems in a much more uh, skillful way. And of course, when they were themselves in this dramatic situation, we could see that they were more or less following up on the uh, uh, previous uh, uh, tools and uh, recipes that the Japanese had invented. QE was invented by Japan before it was applied by the other advanced economy. And uh, we, it, it, it is something which uh, is re really telling in terms of uh, understanding exactly what is happening. We had also uh, a discussion on uh, the uh, overall uh, sentiment that we could transform or reset the, the terms was, uh, uh, I would say, utilized by Bertrand uh, Badré, uh, the overall global uh, financial potentials and approaches in order to privilege the uh, environmental uh, issue, which is by many considered as a major one. I would add myself that we probably have a lot of uh, uh, other dimension in the uh, global finance that we should have in mind. Of course, the green issue and the environmental uh, crisis issue, which is there, and I have to say that Laurent Fabius was extremely eloquent on that, but we have, of course, also uh, a lot of issues that are associated with developments, and uh, so are more on the uh, uh, problem of uh, the countries that are not yet emerging, that are in the developing world, not yet emerging. We have also the issue which is gigantic of inequalities, inequalities in the advanced economy and inequalities also in the emerging economy, which is a major, major issue associated with uh, perhaps some reset of uh, the overall approach of global finance. Now I see that I have only three minutes left. Let me conclude. It seems to me that there was a consensus in that group on the fact that uh, a lot of hard work remained to be done in the overall prudentials and approaches of uh, global finance, that it would be made even more difficult at a time where we did not yet had a new multilateralism crystallizing on the basis of a new global consensus, that we were in a very difficult situation from that standpoint. I think that all participants were in favor of working out as soon as possible this new consensus on, on the new multilateralism, which would be necessarily much more multipolar, much more deconcentrating, if I may, much less in the hands, of course, of the advanced economy, as I already said. But again, uh, the forces that are coming from executive branches, from public opinions, uh, and from all the uh, continents in the world against a rapid uh, new consensus are there, and we have to be fully aware of that. Uh, I would say also that uh, vigilance and a call for, uh, for resilience of all the economy participating in the, the global economy and the global financial world is, uh, was something which was considered essential, taking into account that the sentiment, that new correction, new challenges, perhaps as grave as that we had to observe in 07, 08, and the uh, Lehman Brothers collapse, perhaps less. I mean, we all hoped, of course, that it would be less demanding, but certainly putting into question, nevertheless, the solidity of all our economies, of all our societies. So uh, the reinforcement of the call for vigilance and for improving resilience in all part and parcel of the world was certainly also a consensus in that group. Thank you.